You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Alessandra Tori on the show with me today. She also writes under the pseudonym A.R. Tori, and that is the book that we're here to talk about today, Every Last Secret, the brand new book by A.R. Tori. And this is a must have uh, for all of you thriller lovers out there. You're going to uh, eat this book uh, a bit like I have. And uh, welcome to the show, Alessandra. Thank you. It's really great to be here. And I'm so excited to have you. Um, Alessandra, we have begun the last 1,000 shows with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? My first memory is a great question. I get so many questions and I've never gotten this question, so I love it. Um, my first memory was, um, I was, I want to say like seventh or eighth grade and we had a writing assignment to write a short story and I, and I loved it. It was one of those things like, I'm never excited about anything at school, but that was just my, you know, my dream. And I had a great time and I wrote what I thought was this masterpiece of the story and I submitted it certain that, you know, my teacher would call my parents and be like, oh my gosh, we have the next, you know, um, literary genius on our hands. <laughs> and, um, and I waited just so anxiously to get that back. And when I got it back, I got like a B or a B plus or something with like, you know, my paragraphs were too long or, you know, I didn't use three to five sentences per paragraph or something. And I was so dismayed because I thought I had really written something amazing. Um, and my teacher, you know, I was just never, it was never anything I was encouraged to pursue. So my dream of being a writer kind of died then. Um, and I never thought about writing again after that. Um, I read all the time and I had thought that I would love to be a book editor. I thought I would be a great book editor. Um, but I never really thought about writing again for me, um, until 2012 when my mom started writing a book and I was, um, a novel and she was telling me about her process and I was just fascinated and I, I didn't know anything about self-publishing. It was, everything was new to me. And I was like, man, this is so cool. And I had a summer ahead of me. I just lost my job and I thought, you know, this summer, I think I'll write a book. And it was just a whim and that eight years later, you know, I mean, it was a whim that changed my life. So thank goodness for that. And thank goodness for self-publishing because <laughs> I wouldn't have ended up where I am now. And now I'm, I'm hybrid, I'm traditional and self-published, but that's how I got there. You have one of the most fascinating stories <laughs> um, of, of your journey to, uh, to publishing and to where you are now. And it it's so fortuitous that that you happen to kind of get the writing bug again from your mom at the same time that this whole Kindle revolution mm -hmm. was just starting and self publishing came out of um the dark ages and and came out of the corners where people you know snickered and <laughs> and and it became a yeah. a legitimate path to um you know, to publishing and to, you know, finding your audience and connecting with your readers uh, and all of that. Um, how do you feel like um, self-publishing, we'll, we'll just talk about that for a minute, self-publishing has matured over the last, you know, eight years because uh, 2012 was was really at that golden age. The Kindle had just debuted, you know, a, a year or two maybe before I'm, I'm losing track of when yeah, exactly that was. Right. Mm -hmm. but, but KDP was really coming into um, its own and, and becoming a, a great platform for creators. Um, but being someone that was there from the beginning, uh, virtually through now, and, and we all know that KDP has been through some ups and downs and working out some growing pains and things like that. How do you feel like that trajectory 
uh, has has continued over this time? And where do you see yourself now? So self-publishing, honestly, I was someone who had zero confidence in my writing. So I talk to authors all the time who have dreamed of being an author and they went to school for that or they've been writing and submitting and whatever else for, you know, for decades. I was, I was not that person. I was fairly convinced my writing was horrible, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, so I never would have gone the traditional route of querying and sending off manuscripts because I didn't have that confidence that the book was good. Anything that I wrote was good. Um, so self-publishing was great because it allowed me to write a book that I didn't have to tell anyone about. And I did not tell a soul. I didn't tell my mother, you know, um, I didn't tell, I told my husband and that was it. Um, so it, knowing that I could write something and just put it out there and see who bought it and what the reviews were was really, um, freeing me. Um, so it was no risk in, in my opinion, and it doesn't cost anything, you know, so there, there was no investment. And back then in 2012, it was kind of the wild, wild west. Um, it was still very much snubbed, um, and looked down on and for good reason, because I, I, I was the worst Fender of them all. I, I self-published my book. I made my cover myself. I wrote it. I read it over twice, found like six typos. It was like, this thing's good to go. Right. And I published <laughs> it like no formatting, no editor, no proofreader, nothing. Um, and that is what a lot of self-published books were back then. I mean, they really, nowadays, it's really hard to tell a self, a good self-published book from a traditional book. It's, it, you know, it's right. virtually impossible to tell the difference. Um, and our editorial processes are virtually identical. But back then, anybody, to, I mean, still can, anybody could write anything and put it up there. And you had a lot of crap out there. But there was, a, there was so much need and there was so little competition that people were making money easily, you know, and I was one of them. Um, so at what, what happened... So I got a traditional deal off my first book. Um, and it was back then when publishers were kind of scrambling and there was this um, group of indies that were just killing it with book sales, you know, and, and the traditional publishers are like, we want that, you know? <laughs> um, right. So, and they were buying these books post publication. Um, I'd already earned 50 or 60 grand off it. And then they were going to buy it from me then, you know, after the initial like sales um, peak had already occurred. and. Um, so what happened is there was such easy money to be had that then the market quickly became saturated and as, and it became more accepted and, um, everyone had to step up their game because we suddenly had competition and it wasn't as easy as it had been before. And so suddenly professional covers started appearing, professional editing and, um, and we all had money to invest. So we were no longer broke you know, hobbyist, this was our job and our livelihood. Um, so there became much more of a business aspect that entered the play. And, um, and that's how it, it is now, um, that the market is starting to become a little less saturated in my opinion, because so many people that were making easy money have had to go back to their normal jobs. But, um, but nowadays it self-publishing can really stand on its own against traditional publishing. And there are some genres like romance where traditional publishers have all but backed out um, because they can't compete with us as indies. Um, and I, I can tell you, I've hit the New York Times list seven times, all with self-published books. I've never hit the New York Times list with any of my traditional books. Um, my self-published books outsell my traditional books three to one. Um, so it's much easier for me to be successful as a self-published author than it is for me to be successful as a traditional author. And that's because I have control with, um, with the self-published books. And I believe that I can do a better job of marketing them. So that, that begs the obvious question, um, mm -hmm. uh, Alessandra, if, if someone like you has hit the New York times list seven times as an indie, uh, and you can control the process better as an indie and can, um, you know, kind of micro target things as an indie like like the the big publishers can't. Um, what benefit is there for someone like you to 
uh, to go the traditional route. And and I understand that you're a hybrid and you do both. But what mm-hmm. does what does the traditional route offer you at this point? Yeah, it's a great question. So every last secret, which we're going to talk about today, sure. is a traditionally published book. Now it's traditionally published with Thomas and Mercer, which is an Amazon imprint. Amazon is like its own corner, right, of the publishing world. So it has as the Tom that book being published with Thomas and Mercer, I believe will get me access I can't get on my own or I can get on my own, but I'm going to have to pay a lot of money in advertising with Amazon to get it. Um, So in my mind, I have built in value um, that is that I'm willing to give up um, a large percentage of my royalties to get um, and that get access to that audience. Uh, I still would go with a traditional publisher like Hachette or Harlequin. Those are my other two publishers. Um, I would still, to this day, sign a deal with a traditional publisher if it's the right deal. Um, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, it could be completely wrong, but my opinion is that um, traditional publishers, they, they produce hits. They produce hits every year and they have marketing dollars and they have placements that are very hard for indies to get. So, um, and I see books, I see successful indie authors like Karen Fisher, um, who has a huge audience and who has great success as an indie author, but she went mainstream this year with the wives. Um, and that was the publish, that was the right publishing deal for her to make. And if you, if they really get behind your book and push it, um, they can do really great things with that, but they only do that to a certain number of books, you know, each month or each year, you know, in each genre. And, um, and if you can become one of those books, then it's worth it. It's worth giving up the control and it's worth giving up whatever, because there's still that mainstream audience that it is hard for us sometimes to reach as indies. It's easier with COVID because nobody's going to bookstores and walking down aisles, but, um, but there's still a ton of money to be made in print sales and in um, audiobook placements and things like that, that again, we as indies still don't have full access to. Your, um, your self-published books and, and the ones that, that really built your, um, uh, your reputation, uh, you, you publish as Alessandra and this book is published as A.R. Tory. Is, is that one um, of the distinctions between uh, self-publishing and traditional publishing, that there are certain genres that are better for one as opposed to the other. Um, and, and I understand why you're publishing as two different names. It helps to kind of segment, um, those different audiences and, and, and target those. But is there one that, that, uh, one genre that, that just blows up as with self-published and, and one, the other? Absolutely. Yeah. So romance is pretty much dominated by self-published authors. Um, Romance readers read faster. Um, They have a bigger appetite. Um, The average romance reader, avid romance reader will read three to five books a week. Um, So in order to do that, they need to have inexpensive books. um, And traditional pricing normally is too high for them. They also are big Kindle and limited readers, which traditional publishing does not participate in. So uh, romance, you're, you're going to find easier success with self-published books. Um, young adult, on the other hand, is a much bigger print market. Um, it's pretty, you don't see a lot of self-publishers making a lot of money in young adult. N- not to say there aren't some, but it's, if you're going to be young adult, uh, oftentimes you want a tr- traditional deal. Um, and th- I know I'm not intimately familiar with science fiction and things like that. So I can't speak on those as much. Um, but also the, um, the suspense market is, is very much, um, uh, well, it's, it's, everything's dominated by household names, right? So it's, it's, how do you become one of those household names? Um, and a lot of times that's built by traditional houses, but it's also built with time. So I can't speak on all genres, but those are the ones that I'm aware of. I saw. A, and another it, oh, thing. Yeah, go sorry. Ahead. No, I just go wanted ahead. to touch on you saying two pen names. So um, when I signed my first, um, I signed a three book deal with Hachette um, and they wanted me to use a different pen name for my girl in 60 tri- 
Girl in 6E trilogy. And um, so we went with A.R. Tori. Uh, Alessandra is a pen name, um, but A.R., they wanted a different pen name. So, and it was because they wanted to distinguish the audiences. If I was going to give advice to another author, I would say don't have a second pen name unless you absolutely are making drastic jumps in genre. You can normally, I mean, readers aren't dumb, right? A thriller book looks different than a romance novel. Um, so, but uh, but that it that established Air Tory, and then when Thomas and Mercer purchased Every Last Secret, they wanted to use a different pen name, and I said, "Well, I'm not going to have three pen names." So. <laughs> So we need right. to make it. So it's either going to be A.R. Tori or it's going to be Alessandra. And Alessandra doesn't make sense because that's my romance name. So we went with A.R. Um, and I then moved The Ghost Rider, which was a self-published book under A.R. Tori, um, because it was psychological suspense. So I have two brand names, but um, but it makes it divides my audience. And I think that was a mistake when Hachette did that, um, because there are readers to this day who will read anything I write as Alessandra, and they don't even realize that A.R. Tori exists. And they would jump genres um, if they knew about A.R. Tori, but most of them don't. A hitman with a conscience. Ian Bragg is paid to kill people. Only bad people and not many, but for a great deal of money. Case the target. Make the hit. Move on until he meets the woman with sparkling green eyes who changes everything. A few pre-readers had this to say about Ian Bragg. Mark Dawson, million-selling thriller author, says a rip-roaring ride from start to breathless finish. Craig Martell hit a home run with the operator. The taut, lean prose and lightning-fast pace make this a page-turner without sacrificing an ounce of story or depth. You'll find yourself rooting for the hitman main character as he faces the toughest decision of his career. The Operator is the start of a new thriller series I expect to see burning up bestseller list for years to come, says A.C. Fuller, author of The Crime Beat and Alex Vane Media Thrillers. Suave, romantic, and lethal, Ian Bragg is everything you want in a highly paid assassin. Can't wait to ride this train, says James Blatch, self-publishing formula. It's been a long time since I fell this hard in love with a book, a very long time. Author of Women of Wine County Romantic Suspense, Terry Wells Brown says, Grab this book from Craig Martell, The Operator. Both Barrels Publishing is the brainchild of successful indie author James P. Sumner. He has self-published over 15 titles in the last five years and has over 800,000 downloads so far in his career, meaning he has a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with the indie publishing community. Knowing the struggles of the modern-day indie author as well as he does, he wanted to create a platform that would allow writers of any level to learn the ropes, navigate the pitfalls, and produce a professional novel without wasting time or money in the process. Both Barrels Publishing is the perfect one-stop shop for any indie author, combining James's expertise with his own team of editors and designers so you can help your novel realize its full potential and learn how to publish yourself. The purpose of Both Barrels Publishing is to help indie authors get their novels ready for publication without all the stress, hassle, and unnecessary expense. We want to make your lives easier, which is why we're giving you access to a top-notch team to publish your novels along with a generous discount on their services. You can also work one-on-one -on -one with James to learn the intricacies of self-publishing. No hidden cost, no false promises. We simply want you to publish the best version of your novel. BothBarrelsPublishing.com well, That was going to be my next question, was um, are, are, are readers really surprised when, when they find out that Alessandra and AR are the same person? Um, you know, one, uh, Tori is not exactly um, a household name like Smith or Jones or something. I mean, it, it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to, <laughs> to put two and two together. Um, and and if you read your prose, um, even though you're writing different genres, the voice is still yours. Um, right. it, of course, there's some subtle differences. And uh, and, and and I'm sure that you your mindset is a little different when writing one or the other. But it's still you. It still sounds like you. Um, yeah. do, do you do you feel like that that the whole pen name thing and and you you touched on it a little bit there. 
But do you think that's as important now as it was maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago that that readers are, are, are not as segmented as we think that they are? I don't. First of all, I agree. I, I don't think readers are as segmented as, as we think. I think there are certain things, sci-fi and romance, they probably don't share a very common audience. Um, I think I certainly try to advertise as much as I can that Alessandra and AR are the same person. But I think where you lose that reader is when they're scrolling through a retailer or walking down a bookstore if, and they see A.R. Tory as the name on the book, they might they wouldn't logically be like, oh, I wonder if that's Alessandra Tory. You know, um, yeah. they just they just keep just keep skimming titles um, where if they saw Alessandra, I'm like, oh, I've read her before. And then they might pick it up. Um, so but I think that. Um, I think it's an older mentality and I think it's the same, like, you know, I always heard, and I don't, this might not be true, but I heard that, um, the reason Nora Roberts went with JD Robb is, um, she was published in fast, you know, and back then they used to be like, Oh, readers can only take, you know, so many books a year <laughs> right. from an author, which is crazy. Yeah, um, we've blown so, that out of the water. Yeah. <laughs> we've blown that out of the water. So they, uh, so, and I, I mean, I think that was, um, that being said, uh, I do know there's a distinct difference between a J.D. Robb book and a Nora Roberts book, but, um, but I meet readers all the time who aren't aware that they're the same person or aren't even aware that J.D., who J.D. Robb is, you know, where they might buy every Nora Roberts book, um, that they see that comes out. So you've got, you've got very, you've got, you've got two types of readers. You have the readers who just pluck books off shelves and read them. And and the, and move on and find something else. And then you have those readers that follow the authors and look them up on social media and visit their website and sign up for their newsletter, you know. And you have and they're very loyal to those to certain authors when they find an author they like. And they're um, and I don't know the division, but I would guess that that more loyal reader is only ten percent or fifteen percent of the reading population. And I think the the rest is um is a lot of just grab and go you know they see a cover they like they glance at it looks good and they buy it i uh i saw a video that you uh posted probably a couple of years ago i think um on how you outline your novels and you've got this this stack of index cards and you you really um kind of visualize the novel by having the the rows and columns of cards in front of you and and kind of work through the progression from beginning to end um, as you visualize the novel. And I, I think, and correct me if I get this wrong, but you said in the video that you do it this way to see if a book um, is good enough to write, like if the story mm -hmm. idea is strong enough for you to pursue. Um, it, it seems to me that you're a very visual um, uh or that you conceptualize things visually in the beginning, at least to kind of get yeah. your head around what the story is. Um, could you talk a little bit about your your planning process and how you decide, as you said, whether a story idea is strong enough to write or not? Sure. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of really great ideas, but they're like short story ideas, right? <laughs> like yeah. I have a few of those. Like um, I really want to write a book about you know X Y Z, but I can't see it it's it's a great short story idea but i can't it's what it's going to be is it's going to end up being a subplot of a bigger book um but it's not enough to fill you know 300 pages so what i like to do before i start because a lot of authors just get really excited about something and just dive in and then 20,000 words later like they've run out of something to to talk about so then they create drama um and it's just not a fulfilling reading or writing experience. Um, so I like to, to visualize as much as I can about my book. And I am a panther. I'm not an outliner, but I do do a very, I do sketches and I do um, what I call my, my note card method um, so that I can get a sense of, of where the story is. And a lot of times I'll use that um, rough framework. So my process is I normally have an idea. I have a whole list of ideas. So um, whenever I get an idea, normally the most brilliant ideas come when you're like halfway through a book <laughs> and I'm saying you're starting to get bored with that book. 
So some juicy idea comes up that tries to lure you away. But I never leave my current book. I always, um, I'll take a couple hours and I'll write a scene or two and then I'll set it aside. Um, and I have this stack of, of ideas. Um, so when it comes time to write a new book, I sit down and I read through all of my ideas and I pick whichever idea I'm the most excited about. Do on that idea for two or three weeks. Um, so I normally do this when I'm in like the editorial process of another book. So I've got some time. So I do on it and try to envision all the different places it could go. Um, and a lot of times through that process is when I'll either start drawing a plot arc. I, I literally draw like plot arc on paper and then start um, writing at different places along the arc, different things that could happen. Oh, or I'll do what I call my note card method. And if you just search Alessandra Tori note card method, or if you have show notes, um, you can link it there. But sure. um, I do a, a note card method where I'll um, plot out the major scenes I'm aware of. And then I kind of start filling in the blank. And pretty soon I'll be like, oh, this writes me into a corner and there's nowhere I can go with this book. Or, um, or I'm like, oh, this could, you know, this could, this could happen. Like this, there's enough here. And once I feel confident enough and I really feel like I know the characters, then I'll start writing. And I used to never do that. I'd get an idea and I would sit down and start writing. And it would just be just weeks or months of waste of time because um, I'd write a book that really shouldn't have been written to begin with. And at that point, you've really invested a lot of time. So you either have to turn this into something marketable or junk. And I've done both. Um, and I don't want to ever do that again. I, w- I want to know from the beginning that it's a, it's a winnable book um, before I really pour my heart and soul into it. So it sounds like that you've taken the, the arguments from both sides and, and sort of answered them. You know, the, the pantsers will tell you, well, mm-hmm. if you plan it ahead of time, then all of the, uh, the excitement has been written out of it because you already know what's yeah. going to happen. And the other side will say, well, if you don't know where you're going, then you're just wasting time because this may or might, may not even pan out. It may not be an actual story idea. It sounds like that you're answering the, you know, is this a viable story, but leaving the big uh, or, or, or a lot of the smaller answers, uh, questions unanswered so that you can discover those as you're writing. But, you know, the potential is there to get from from beginning to end. That's exactly right. So there are plotters, there are outliners, and there are pantsers. And right. I'm in between, which I call myself a panty liner. Um, <laughs> most men hate that term. My students don't. Well, I think it's they hilarious. like planter. Yeah, they like planter, which is fine. Plotter and pantser. Um, so if if my book is a road trip, I know I know where I'm leaving from, and I know where I'm going, and I know a few places I want to stop along the way, but, um, but I give myself a lot. I have no idea when I'm going to sleep, you know, and where I'm going to stop to eat. And if I see something exciting and I want to veer off the road and take a day and explore something that I do it. Um, so, but I know the gist of, you know, I'm going from Florida to California and I want to stop at the Grand Canyon, you know, (laughs) and Oklahoma city or something like that. And there's potential for lots of crazy characters to meet along the way. (laughs) Yeah. And if, if I do like take a hard right turn in the story, then I normally, I'm like, Ooh, like what just happened? You know, like my character did something crazy. Then I finish the scene and then I go to my note cards or I draw out the plot line and I'm like, let me make sure this path that that character just went down could lead somewhere and maybe it leads somewhere that's a totally different ending than I initially thought out. But I want to make sure that that's actually going to happen before I let that character keep wandering down that path. So Alessandra, one of, one of my favorite things to discover about books is, is uh, how they began the the beginnings of an idea. Um, When, when you first get the idea for a new book or a new series, and this is just completely new, um, you didn't know anything but before this, is it usually a character that comes to you uh, or is it a plot point? Um, is, is it a setting and then the characters walk on that stage? What is that first inkling of the idea that comes to you? 
it's normally a character that's in an odd situation. That's normally what it is. Um, inspiration comes from everywhere. Like, um, I was reading an article about hoarding, hoarding, um, the other day. And I was like, I want to write a book about a hoarder, but I have no idea what what that book is like i was gonna try to write a romance novel and my assistant's like no one wants to fall in love with the hoarder you know so then i was like oh well maybe the girl could be the hoarder you know and um, so it's from the point of view of the hoarder um i don't have a i don't have a book there yet but it's something that i'm i'm keeping in the back of my head and i'm thinking about and i'll do something i'll get a flat tire or i'll have a conversation with somebody who tells me some cool story and I'll be like, oh, that's the hoarder book, right? Like that's the fit. Like um, that's where it's going to go. But I don't know yet there. I also want to write a book with a blind character. So I have a lot of characters that are kind of in my Rolodex that I'm developing, but I have no idea what's going to happen to them. Um, and so I'm just kind of waiting then because I also have a lot of ideas for stories, but I don't have characters for them. So I kind of wait for the two to find each other. Um, and then eventually they do eventually there's some there's some click into place and that's um and that's normally where the story comes from but some of my best stories um didn't like um there was i wanted to write about a character a book about a character with multiple personality disorder um which isn't really a thing it's just disassociate disassociative identity disorder um, and, uh, so I was thinking like what, you know, I was in the head of uh, that character and them waking up and not knowing what they did or having two different personalities. And then I realized the story would be so much more interesting if it was from the opposite point of view, like the person who's dating that person. Um, so a lot of times you might have a great idea or you might, and you don't realize you just have to find that missing piece. And then once you find that missing piece, then it all comes together. Um, and I try to do all of that before I start writing, even though I, I hate outlining. If, if you told me to write an outline, it, it would lock me up, you know, creatively and, and I wouldn't be able to write a thing. But I do like returning to what we were talking about earlier, having an idea where things are going. I did a horrible job of answering that question. No, you did uh, a fantastic <laughs> job of, of answering that. I, I, I completely followed you. Um, the new book, Every Last Secret, uh, tell me about the beginning of this book. What was the idea that sparked this book? So Every Last Secret was one of those things that came from real life. So most of my books have something real in them. Um, somebody I know or a story I've heard or, you know, it's based on somebody in my life um, and their personality. So every last secret, I had a very close friend um, who um, suspected her husband was cheating on her. And we really um, became like sluice in terms of finding out whether or not that was the case. But it also like me and my husband had so many conversations at the dinner table because he was also very close to this couple um, about it. And I tell him everything. So I was telling him about our suspicions. And, um, and it just made me like the dynamic of a couple who, um, is going through, and it's really two couples involved. So the premise of every last secret is that you have, um, a golden couple, right. Um, wealthy and brilliant and, um, successful and, um, next door to them moves another couple who is, um, not who is basically trying to keep up with the Joneses and that couple become, they become close friends and their lives start becoming infil infiltrated by this couple. And it's the dy dynamic that grows between the two women, the two wives as, um, as one of the wives really starts um, becoming too close with her husband, the other husband. So um, there's so much dynamic in each marriage and every marriage, marriages are fascinating to me. Um, you're stuck with this person, you know, for, for the rest <laughs> of your life, um, for the most part. Um, and, and, and people change, you know, I mean, people change over the course of decades 
and you might be married to someone that wasn't the person you were married to 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so, uh, the villainous character, Nina is such a, is really based on the woman, um, that was becoming obsessed with my friend, um, and wanting her life and wanting, um, and it, and I don't even know that the woman was that interested in her husband. I think it was all about beating my friend, um, and becoming in her mind superior to her. And that involved, um, you know, beating her with social media posts and, and with her husband. Um, so there, I was like, I mean, the whole thing was the most interesting thing, but it was also heartbreaking to watch. Um, and it made me think, what would I do in that situation? What would I do if someone went after my husband? And, um, and what would I do if he responded, you know? Um, and would like, I show my claws or would I pack my stuff and leave, you know? Um, and so the story explores, um, how these two women handle that. And, um, and it was so much fun to write. I, it was one of those books. I just, I didn't want to leave their world, um, because there's so many different possibilities there. The, the characters in this book, um, there's someone everyone can relate to in this book. And, uh, some characters are very likable. Some of them are not so likable. Um, what, what that's saying it very nicely well I, I <laughs> a try, lot of reviewers are like i hate all of these characters <laughs> <laughs> i try to be diplomatic um but talk a little bit about if you will uh, about writing characters that we may not initially love uh you uh-huh. know we've all read books where we just instantly connect with the protagonist and everything is just um you know they're they're nearly perfect and that's rarely real life um but you know we all know people that that you really don't like this person until you get to know them and uh and and talk a little bit about how you create characters that are are believable in in their real lifeness uh and 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 maybe working on that character development sure so um Every Last Secret is an interesting cast of characters because the the good guys aren't, you know, er, everyone has a little villain in them, I think. That's what I think. I like to believe that because it makes for much more interesting characters. Um, and what we think inside is often different than the person that we portray ourselves to be. And I think that I could be capable of terrible things, even if maybe I never could, you know, but it doesn't mean that, you know, you don't have thought. And so I tapped into a lot of that when I was writing. Um, well, I also saw how push, how much this whole situation changed my friend because, um, she really was almost like a mama bear. Uh, I'm sorry, not mama bear. That's not the right term. I think it is the right term. Um, she was almost like a mama bear in terms of protecting her life, you know, and her marriage. And it brought out a side of her I had never seen before and would never have thought that I existed. Um, so I think, I think nice, sweet characters are boring. Um, I think books should need a mix and those people exist. But when we were going through edits on Every Last Secret, you know, the editor was like, you know, nobody is this terrible. And it was like, yes, they are. I can take you to this woman <laughs> and introduce you to her. She's crazy. Like I, I, I wrote, you know, with pure confidence because I had met, you know, I had talked, Nina. you know what I mean? I had, I had interacted with this woman, um, the real Nina, you know? So I, I wrote her with confidence because I felt like I knew her. I mean, I did know her, you know? Um, right. so I think that, um, when I was working on developing the other characters, um, it's always tempting to, to, to give a good guy. And it's always tempting to, um, help readers root for certain characters, but the best villains are those that you're rooting for also, right? Like the best books are those where you're kind of torn between who you want to win, right? Like, um, you hate the bad guy, but you also understand why the bad guy is the way that he or she is. Um, so it was important to me that even though Nina was horrible, I wanted the reader 
to empathize with her at some point. Um, and I hope I did that, but I also, um, it was just fun adding the different dimensions because they're, when you're put in difficult situations, different people respond in different ways. Um, and, and then you have some people that are just like the husbands that, um, they just are the way they are and, and it's not perfect. And, um, and it's not nearly as underhanded as the women are, but, um, but they have different motivations. We all have different motivations. So, um, it was fun. Initially when I wrote this book, I wrote it in four different point of views. Um, so it, the book was equally spread out. The first half of the book was from the women's point of view. And the second half of the book was from the men's point of view. Um, and I almost wish we had kept it that way. Um, editorially, they didn't want that. Um, so we switched it, but, um, but it was an interesting dynamic because she spent the whole first half of the book hearing female voices, um, and the second half of the book, um, hearing male voices. And it made me have to be really creative in how I engineered scenes so that I, um, could show different, could show everything that I wanted to show, even if those characters weren't where they needed to be, if that makes sense, so that they could tell that point of view. The uh, these characters um, are are so interesting, and you really grow to um, to care about them, and in maybe not in the ways that you first think. Um, is this a complete story, or do you see? Can you see more life in the future for these characters? No, I think this is it. This is it for them. I would love to write another book, but there's not, like I talked about short story ideas. Like I don't, I have a short story idea for this book, but I don't have a whole novel um, to explore in, in their world. Gotcha. Um, you also um, have some, uh, have a, a course that you're, you're doing um, at Alessandra Tori Inc. Is, <laughs> is that right? Um what got you interested in wanting to uh, to help other people tell their stories? When I started in 2012, like I told you before, I wasn't, I didn't go to school for writing. So I'm completely self-taught. Um, I had a background in banking and real estate. And, um, and I really, when I started writing, my training was reading. I, I read all the time, all different genres, anything. I'd read anything, any fiction I would read. Um, but I had no, I had no training in writing. So I wandered around a lot and made a lot of mistakes, um, in my writing and my marketing and publishing decisions that I made. So it was kind of one of those things, like I created with Alessandra Tori Inc. what I wish I had had, which was like writing for dummies, you know, <laughs> like I needed a step-by-step, -step, this is how you develop characters. And I needed it written in or taught in a way that was relatable to me because I tried, my mom gave me five or six books on craft and they were just laborious for me. I, I never read any of them. I started to read all of them, um, but they were just, I don't know. They, I didn't connect with them. I didn't understand what they were talking about when they talked about character arcs. I didn't know what that meant. Um, so I created um, three courses. I have a writing and publishing and a marketing course um, that was really um, just, step by step. This is how you write a book. This is how you come up with ideas. This is how you develop them, um, how you create characters and do scenes, settings and things like that. And, um, and that led to a Facebook group. And then we started um, a writer's conference. And it's been three years now. We have over 20,000 authors that are part of the community. Um, so it's great. It's, it's not, um, it's me giving back, but it also gives me so much because it, like when I sat down to create the courses, it was like, oh, I need to actually figure out how I do this. Like I write books, but how am I coming up with these characters and how am I describing a scene? And so it really caused me to look at my own process and then research more about how other people did that. Um, because what works for me might not work for you or, you know, for someone else. Well, and, and it really is one of the best ways to solidify your own process is to teach it to someone else. Yeah. <laughs> that it really makes you look at every aspect of everything that you're doing. That's that's fascinating. I love it. Um, the new book, Every Last Secret, is out everywhere now. It's in Kindle edition, audiobook edition, or paperback. 
however you like to get books. There are links to it in the show notes of this episode. Um, Alessandra, this has been so much fun uh, chatting and talking about uh, writing and the new book. Um, where can people find you if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you do? You can find out about my books at alessandratory.com. It's, um, the link will be there. And my AR Tory books and my Alessandra books are both there. Alessandra is romance and romantic suspense. And AR Tory is suspense. So um, sexy suspense and clean suspense, but it's all under AR Tory. So, um, or you can find me on social media. So, and if you're interested, if you are a writer and are interested in that, I have a separate website, which um, Hank mentioned, so alessandratoryinc.com. And that's I-N-K. Uh, yes. Dot com. Yeah. yeah. I try to be witty and it's horrible for my SEO. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll put links to all that in the show notes and make it easy for folks. Um, Alessandra, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Hank. It's been a great time. On an isolated human planet called Phoenix, outside the Galactic Gate Network, a royal empire teeters on the brink of revolution. The new emperor is weak, the old guard seeks power, and a hidden slave cabal manipulates the great and small houses alike. None of this concerns Simeon Brazhnev, newly appointed steward to one of the most powerful heiresses on the planet. Happy to let the royals play their age-old game of catch the crown, Simeon is more concerned with balancing his mistress's books than worrying about affairs of state. But when Simeon discovers evidence of sedition at the highest levels of government buried deep within her finances, he realizes her great peril. Though a slave, he finds himself trapped in political intrigue, desperate to protect his mistress from the royals who would see her dead and the slave rebels who would make her their pawn. Agonized by the choice of turning her over to the authorities or protecting her secrets, Simeon decides to keep faith with his sovereign over his larger duty, thus flinging himself into a world of power, plot, and assassination. If he fails, they both die, and with them the chance at freedom for Simeon's enslaved race. Set in the Salvage title universe, Salvage Mind is the first of three novels in a new breakout series. Available in ebook format and paperback, grab your copy today. Salvage Mind by David Allen Jones. Bone Thief, John Driscoll Book One by Thomas O'Callaghan. A sociopathic killer is using the internet to lure seemingly random women to their gruesome deaths in New York City. During his heinous murder spree, this madman is extracting the bones of his victims. His sheer brutality has the residents of the Big Apple in panic mode. Who is this twisted psycho who's abducted a housewife in broad daylight only to dispose of her lifeless body alongside a lake in Prospect Park, nailed the boneless remains of a nameless drifter to the underside of a boardwalk at Rockaway Beach, allowed the gutted corpse of a single parent to wash ashore under the Brooklyn Bridge, and has had the audacity to leave the desecrated body of the Magnolia Tea heiress rotting atop trash at one of the city's sanitation dumps. NYPD's top cop, Homicide Commander John W. Driscoll, has never witnessed such savagery. Hammered daily by the district attorney, the mayor, and the police commissioner, the lieutenant, who's battling his own inner demons, must use every resource available to put an end to the killings. In a race against time, Driscoll, aided by Sergeant Alagante and Detective Cedric Tomlinson, sets out on a roller coaster of an investigation to first identify the villainous fiend and then put an end to his butchering. Grab Bone Thief by Thomas O'Callaghan now.